Anyway, if you would open your Bibles and turn to Revelation, Revelation chapter 5. And why don't you go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So we're going to read through the entirety of this chapter. And if you're without a Bible, just look on the screen behind me and and the text will be projected there. So follow as I read. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and his seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He has seven horns, that speaks of complete authority and power, and seven eyes, that speaks about complete wisdom, which are the seven spirits of God, and that speaks about completeness and wholeness, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open his seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. The Lord will bless the reading of his word. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this scene, Lord, that's been recorded in the scriptures. And we thank you, God, for the hope, the confidence, confidence that we have through Jesus Christ. And I ask, Lord, that as we spend time in your word this morning, that you would say to each of us exactly what we need to hear today. Father, I do want to pray for Pat Miller as I was just handed this request on her behalf. God, as she's been taken to the hospital, Lord, because of an issue with her heart, I pray that you touch her, protect her, bring her through. We're believing that good report. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you're seated, we have our declarations and our prayers. So let's say these together aloud and loudly. I possess the mind of Christ. Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see and give me ears to hear. I'm a believer who unswervingly believes and trusts God's word as the absolute truth. Lord, give me the keys to understand the times in which I live. I will remain alert to the serious hour in which I live and will receive from the Holy Spirit the power and anointing to share these truths with others, compelled by God's love. Lord, enable me to understand your prophetic word and how it relates to today. I am a hope distributor in these last days. Father, I thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, is my hope and the hope of the world. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Our study of Revelation brings us to John's invitation to the throne room of the universe, God's throne room. 
And chapters 4 and 5 are one vision, one of many that the apostle John receives and is instructed to record. And this vision sets up everything that follows. Now, there are four primary features in this vision, perspective, personalities, purpose, and praise. And we're going to look at each one of those, perspective, personalities, purpose, and praise. First of all, perspective. As we saw last week, Jesus is invited by, I'm sorry, John is invited by Jesus to come up here. And with that invitation, John finds himself in God's throne room. John has entered the heavenlies. Now, there are two views regarding John's experience. One view is that John simply received a vision while he was on the island of Patmos. And the second view is more dramatic, that John actually went to heaven and that he had an experience similar to that that the Apostle Paul recorded in 2 Corinthians when he spoke about a man that was taken to the heavenlies, and then we, make, we, we can infer that that man indeed was the Apostle Paul. In speaking of the heavenlies, here's what the Bible is referencing. Now, the physical realm is what we see. The spirit realm, or the heavenlies, what we don't see is just as real as the physical realm, really, if it's not even more real than this realm. And I say that because everything that we have in the physical realm was spoken from the spirit realm by our creator God. So the spirit realm is as real as what we see and we touch and we hear this morning. If we could see the activity of the spirit realm, it would blow us away. It's in the spirit realm, for example, that we find angels. We can't see them, but God has given us angels to attend us. That's what we read in Psalm 91. He will give his angels charge over you. Angels attend us, not because of our worthiness, but because that's God's charge to them. So for the record, angels accompanied us into God's house this morning. They have been worshiping God right alongside us today. What do you think of that? Because they have been given us, to us, and God has charged them with us. What John is describing is the realm of the holy. Now, I don't want to be sidetracked, but I, I do want you to know that there are two interpretive approaches to what is occurring here. One interpret, interpretation states that what's happening here is not focused on John, but on the church. So we look at Revelation 2 and 3, where John is addressing the seven churches, and we've talked about how they're representative of different eras in church history. So we look at Revelation 2 and 3 as the church age. Then we look at Revelation chapter 4 and 5 as the rapture of the church, when the church is called to be with Jesus. And then from Revelation 6 on through to the end is a succession of things that will happen on the earth following the rapture of the church. That's one interpretation. Then the second interpretation is that what's happening here is a straightforward description of John's own experience. And I believe I can make an argument that both are really working in tandem and will do that when we deal with the rapture of the church. In any case, we are presented with a glimpse of the ultimate tomorrow, an unfolding of all which will culminate in the coming of Jesus, the vanquishing of Satan, and the unveiling of a new heaven and a new earth. Personalities. In John's record of what he saw, we're introduced to several individuals. The Father, and we find God seated on the throne. The Spirit, 
The passage speaks of seven spirits. And as I said last week, there's only one Holy Spirit, but seven is the number of perfection. And that speaks of the Spirit's completeness, his wholeness, and his holiness. And the Son, Jesus in this context, is spoken of as the Lamb. And we'll spend time, more time, in that particular verse later on in the message. The 24 elders... And these are representative personalities that deal with redemption. The entire redemptive order is before us. The Old Testament, we have the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 patriarchs. The New Testament, we have the 12 apostles. And at the center is the cross. Then the four living creatures. And we spoke last week of these four heavenly beings which worship God at his throne. And for all eternity, these four beings worship God by saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. And the purpose. You know, central to the scene that's put before us is a scroll. And the scroll is a book within a book. The scroll is a book within the book of Revelation. And it's described eight times in nine verses. Concerning scrolls, we know that biblical writing was done on a sheet of papyrus about eight inches wide and ten inches long. And if a document was longer than one sheet of papyrus, then the sheets were attached to each other. And to store those writings or to transport them, they were rolled up or they were scrolled up. Now, in Roman times, and Revelation was written during Roman times, when a person prepared their will, seven witnesses attested to the will. And then each one sealed the will with wax. Wax was poured over different points on the scroll to seal it up. When the person died and the will was to be executed, the seals could be broken only by each witness or by a legal representative of each witness. The scroll that we read about in Revelation is one of those scrolls that I just described. And this scroll unfolds everything, everything that happens in chapters 5 through 18 of Revelation, and then what happens in chapters 19 through 22 have to do with the result of the unscrolling of the scroll. So the scroll is the centerpiece of Revelation. So understanding the function of the scroll gives clarity to all the turmoil that we find as we read through the book of Revelation. So we need to understand the purpose of that scroll because everything that happens is centered around what happens with that scroll. Now chapter 4 moves up to chapter 5 seamlessly. So having entered into the throne room, John is overwhelmed by the awesome scene of worship. And chapter 4 concludes with these words, You are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, say that with me, and by your will they were created and have their being. So in those words of worship, the heavenly creatures and the elders speak of the creator and his will. God has a will for earth a heavenly design, and a benevolent purpose. Now, continuing as if there were no chapter division, John tells us right next to the end of chapter 4, and then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides sealed with seven seals. And an angel proclaimed, who is worthy to break the seals 
and open the scroll. So let's answer four questions about the scroll. First of all, what does the scroll contain? Friends, the scroll contains God's will for our world. The scroll contains God's will for planet Earth. Everything that takes place in Revelation focuses on what the Lord is doing on this planet and what he's doing with mankind. What's written in the scroll has to do with what God originally wanted humanity to experience, what came to be experienced, and what God is doing to release what he originally intended. Let me repeat that. In the scroll, we find what God originally wanted humanity to experience, what came to be experienced, and what God is doing to release what he originally intended. God created this planet. He created earth to be inhabited by people. Listen up. Regardless of where you stand on the old earth, young earth debate, regardless of where you stand in that, men and women are not the product of millions of years of natural selection. We are the product of divine creation. So regardless of where you are in the debate, when it comes to humankind, we've been around for 6,000 years. And it was God who created us. He made us. He breathed life into us. The creator did all of that. God created man and woman. Humans are specially created beings with a high destiny and eternal significance. Did you hear me? Men and women are God's creation, and he has created us with a high destiny and eternal, get that, eternal significance. Friends, please understand something. Understand something today with every attack against God's created order. Please understand that that is diabolical, that that does come from the enemy. Because with every attack against God's created order, humans move further away from God's original intention. So the very thing, the very things that people are looking for, a sense of destiny and significance, they move further away from with every attack on God's created order because God created us to have a high destiny and he created us with never mind significance here on earth, never mind answering the question, why am I here on this planet? He created us with eternal significance and with every attack against God's created order, people People move further and further away from his original design and intentionality. That's why, that's why we just can't let things go. Not because we're going to get into a fight with a politician, but because we are in a fight with the enemy. And the prize are the souls of God's people. The prize are souls that God created and that he wants for himself. So we fight. And we speak up. So I'll just throw this in there. There is a difference between the freedom of religion and the freedom of worship. And let me tell you, liberals are good at spinning definitions and then throwing them on us. There is a difference between the freedom of religion and freedom of worship. And you'll hear them say, oh, but you can have freedom of worship. Freedom of worship means go into your little houses of worship and do your thing in there, but don't you bring it out here. Freedom of religion says, I'm going to the marketplace. I'm going to the public square. I'm going to speak for Jesus, period. So, friends, we need to understand we're in a battle. But it's not with politicians. It's with the devil. There are lost souls in confusion 
being told by society that we should celebrate confusion. So most recently now, Miley Cyrus, remember? Hannah Montana, Disney Channel's darling. So most recently, uh, she says she's pansexual. Pansexual. So I, I kept reading the article. She said, I don't identify with any gender. What does that mean? What exactly does that mean? I don't identify with any gender. You know, I did that series on social issues a little while ago, and I'm going to have to revisit that, and I will deal with this matter of transgender. We have to. And friends, there are people, understand something. There are people who are truly confused. There are people who are hurting. There are people who need answers, and we need to be able to deliver God's Word with compassion because there are people who are truly questioning their identity. But then there are other people, they're just given to lust. Oh, Pastor, that won't win you any points. Well, I'm not running for office. <laughs> not yet, anyway. <laughs> hey, you never know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Susie. <laughs> As my campaign director, thank you, all right. <laughs> Friends, there are lost souls in confusion. At creation, we were given dominion. Human dominion meant that God gave humanity the responsibility and untainted capacity to develop and govern this planet. The world was to be cultivated to all its potential without the inhibiting presence of sickness, death, or evil. Advancements that we've made to date, I believe that we would have accomplished in short order had sin not come into the planet, but without any evil design or motivation attached. What we're seeing today was never the plan. God had a much better plan for humanity. But God's plan has not happened because of the fall. The fall. That's a term that we use to describe when man stepped outside obedience to alignment and, I'm sorry, stepped outside obedience to an alignment with the will and purpose of God. And then to add to the tragedy in doing so, man submitted himself to the rule of Satan. Satan, a very real sinister being, who opposes God and hates everything that is of God. And this resistance to God's purpose has brought upon this planet and its inhabitants a curse. So the scroll contains first and foremost a plan that God intended for humankind, but a plan that was sadly defiled by sin. Now, Jesus describes Satan's enterprise this way. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Then Jesus describes his plan. But I have come to that they may have life, abundant life, life to the full, John 10.10. 10. You need to lay hold of this truth. Friends, the Redeemer's plan is to overthrow the deceiver's plan. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, here's the good news. It's really great news. We know that Jesus will ultimately overthrow the enemy, Satan, once and for all, but God's recovery plan has already begun, and it begins in the lives of those who enter into God's will through Jesus Christ. So the personal scrolls of our lives can begin to be unsealed immediately. Jesus, the Redeemer, the Savior, wants to come and open what each of us is intended to be. Jesus wants to unfold God's will in us. Jesus will overthrow the work of the thief and the liar who steals people's identity and throws them into confusion. And it all begins with an invitation for Jesus to come into our lives. Have you done that? 
And if you haven't, oh, give it some thought as I continue bringing God's word to you. The scroll is to be opened in order to put an end to Satan's rule of terror on earth. The scroll holds a promise, but human sin and satanic evil have brought a curse instead. Revelation, the book of Revelation, opens our eyes to the opening of the scroll. And this unsealing is scheduled to bring a release from the curse through a series of judgments that will finally expel Satan. When the scroll's seals are broken, there will come the release of horrendous judgments on earth. And the purpose of God's judgments on earth is not retaliation, but retribution. And there's a difference. See, retaliation is best described this way, I'm going to get even. That's retaliation. Retribution, on the other hand, is the natural byproduct of a violation of essential order. It's a justly deserved penalty. God says, I have created things to work in a way that's good for you. Now, here are the guidelines, my word, my law, so you don't ruin the equipment and mess everything up. And as fallen humans, we figure, well, let me tamper with the law of God just a little and see what happens. Then things blow up in our faces because of the violations. That's retribution, but at a limited level. And friends, let me say that our society has not seen the full force of what's going to occur because marriage, as God designed it, has been tampered with. We, we, we yet are to see the full force of that behavior and that action. Retribution that comes to the whole earth results from mankind getting out of sync with all that God has intended. And the scales of justice, friends, will be balanced, and the earth must reap the horrible harvest of all that it has sown. Again, God's will is released in my life and, and in your life when we repent from our sin and disobedience and we surrender ourselves to Jesus. And at that point, at that point, the devil's rule over our lives is broken. It happens immediately when we surrender to Christ. Who sealed the scroll? Well, God the Father sealed the scroll and he's the one who holds it in his hands. And the fact that God holds the scroll assures us that he is the ultimate controller of earth's destiny. Don't miss this. God has never let go of the scroll. That means that in a situation that looks completely out of control, it is still God who gets the final word. So while he has not caused everything that we see on earth, and he hasn't, he has not caused everything that has happened on earth because he's given us free will, yet we know that he hasn't let go of the earth either. God has never let go of the scroll. And since the scroll is in God's hands, then the curse's worst has been restrained. Three. Why is there concern that the scroll may remain sealed? In Revelation chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, when the angel asks who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, no one steps forward. And the Bible indicates that John begins to weep. Why? Why did John begin to weep? Well, John must have had an awareness of the implications 
Please don't forget that John had been in ministry at this point for some 60 years. He understood and he loved people. And and when you pastor, you identify with the pain and the suffering that people go through. And and, and you care about that. And, And John wept because he knew that if the scroll could be unsealed, things would be different. John wept because until the scroll is unsealed, hell will have its way. And heaven's purpose would not be fully realized. Four, what do we learn about the Lamb's arrival? Well, because no one is worthy to open the scroll, John is weeping. Then one of the elders tells John, look, stop weeping. Look, there's the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. He has triumphed. Everything just changed. Jesus is on the scene, and Jesus has the right to open the scroll. He's distinct from everyone else. No angel, no human, no demon can open the scroll. Only one is worthy, and that's Jesus. But here's an appropriate question. Wait a minute. What about God himself? Why doesn't he open the scroll? Is he not worthy? Friends, this has to do with the administration of earth's affairs. And as I said earlier, and we have it confirmed in Genesis 1 and Psalm 115, dominion of the earth was given to humanity. We can will the will of God, or we can will our own wills, or we can cooperate with the devil's will, but we have been given dominion of this planet. God holds what is his will for earth, but it can only be released if they can be found a worthy human. That's why God became a man. That's why the Word became flesh, so that there could be one in the human race who was not tainted by the curse, and this one would be able to survive the full weight of the burden of the curse for the entire world, rise again, and be victorious. And that one is Jesus Christ. Jesus is able to take the scroll. He is worthy. And that worthiness has to do with meeting every qualification, every required qualification through his righteousness by the power of his dominion over sin. So in verse 6, John says, I saw. And it's interesting. He doesn't say, I saw a prince on a white charger. He says, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. One translation, bearing the fresh marks of slaughter. But wait, John received the revelation in 80 to 85 AD. How could he be seeing Jesus right after his death, resurrection, ascension? Well, don't forget, John has stepped into eternity. So he could see the past just as easily as he could see the future. And he says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Friends, victory was achieved at the cross. Jesus takes the scroll. He takes the scroll from God the Father. And when he does that, now the four living creatures and the elders fall down before the Lamb, holding harps and bowls filled with the incense, which, is our, which are the prayers of God's people, and they begin to give praise. So let me stop right there before I make my final point. So just some insights from that scene. First of all, God is good and his will is benevolent. So although humanity violated the terms of the contract, God holds the scroll. He did not tear it up. So even though humanity violated the contract, he did not tear it up. He held on to it. Friends, he does the same for us personally. Even when we mess up, God does not. He does not shred his purpose. He does not shred his commitment toward us. Somebody say something. We might mess up, but he is still committed to fulfilling his purposes in us. He is still committed to bring us to that place of high destiny. That's why, that's why when we mess up, we need to be quick 
about confessing that to Jesus, humbling ourselves before him, asking him to forgive us. Forget the justification. We have nothing that we can justify. And we receive his forgiveness because the Father has not thrown away the scroll over our lives. Number two, the cross breaks every curse. And as the book of Revelation bears out, Jesus stepped into history in order to triumphantly fulfill God's will and purpose for humankind and this planet. Listen to me. If he can do that with human history, he can do it with my life and with your life. Hear me closely. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that can break any grip that hell has on me. Did you hear me? It's the cross of Jesus. So if you feel, if you feel like something is holding you back, come to Jesus. If you feel like I, I pursued him and I, it seems like I go so far and I hit a wall, come to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Stop trying to work it out on your own because you can't. Give it to Jesus. Bring it into the light. Confess it. Ask him to forgive you. And then here's the next one. And then ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the discipline that you need to not go to that again. So hear me hear me, if you struggle, if you struggle with pornography, you give it to Jesus. You bring it into the light. You ask him to deliver you, and then you don't go anywhere near where you might be tempted. So you may need to give up your iPad. You may, need to, you may need to go back to a flip phone. You may need to give up cable. Oh, I don't know, Pastor, really. Well, Jesus said it this way. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. I'm just asking you to rip out cable. <laughs> Discipline has to come alongside deliverance. The cross can do it. Everything we need, we find at the cross. Freedom is ours through the Lamb of God. Number three, all prayer will be answered. The bowls of incense are filled, the Bible says, with the prayers of God's people. And you've heard me tell you this before, that, that, that there are three answers to our prayers. Yes, no, and wait. Well, really, there's one more response. Because there are many yes answers that have gone unnoticed because we did not recognize them because they weren't the answers we wanted. So there's yes, no, wait, and yes, but not the way I expected. Because we serve a God that's much greater than any one of us that knows a lot more than any one of us. Our prayers, friends, come before God's throne and they're all received as a worship expression of dependence on God. And they're all answered. Well, back to chapter 5. Jesus, the God-man, has defeated sin, hell, and the grave. He now takes the scroll from God's hand the scroll, God's will, and the title indeed to earth, and he begins to open the seals and all kinds of things begin to happen. And we'll talk about that next week. So here's your assignment. You need to read chapters 6 and then chapters 8 and 9. Chapter 6 and chapters 8 and 9 in preparation for next week. So we've considered three of the four features of what John saw, and I'll present the fourth one as I ask Pastor Shannon and the worship team to return to the platform. Perspective, personalities, purpose, and praise. Consider the scene. The Father, scroll in hand. The Holy Spirit is present. The four creatures are present. 
the 24 elders. And then John says, the Lamb of God, Jesus, shows up. Having defeated sin and death, he takes hold of the scroll. When that happens, John says that the four creatures and the elders bow before Jesus and they give him praise. Here's what they say. It's in verses 9 and 10. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. So Jesus comes on the scene. John is distressed. He, one of the elders says, no need to weep. You don't need to weep. Look who I just saw. And Jesus, the Savior, the Redeemer, the conqueror of sin and death takes the scroll from the Father's hands. He's worthy. He, he's met the qualifications as one that's 100% God and 100% man. And as sure as, as soon as he takes the scroll, you've got this activity around the throne. And now those four creatures that we focused on last week, they're bowing and they're worshiping Jesus. And you've got the 24 elders representative of the redemptive order and they're bowing and worshiping Jesus. Now listen, listen. Worship occurs around the throne all the time. That is, that, that's been going on for eternity. We, we covered that last week. But something, this is my speculation, when those individuals began to worship Jesus, something, something must have rung through heaven that was just a little bit different. And I say that because then John says, then I saw thousands upon thousands of angels and 10,000 times 10,000. Now listen, listen, the four living creatures, they're worshiping God all the time, all the time. That's just what they do. That's what they've been called to do. But the angels, they're everywhere. Come on. Some of them are here this morning. The, the, the Lord has given us charge, right? He's told them, now you got, to, you got to keep an eye on this guy and that gal. So they're everywhere. So here's my speculation. Jesus shows up. Jesus takes the scroll. He's about, he's about to see God's will finally, finally fulfilled on this planet, doing whatever it is that needs to be done to set things right. And when those creatures and those elders begin to worship God, it's like those angels, my speculation, must have said, that sounds, that sounds completely different. And all of a sudden, John says, I see thousands upon, they all showed up, thousands upon thousands and 10,000 upon 10,000. He says, they said this, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then John says, hey, hey, it gets better. You've got the four creatures worshiping Jesus. You've got the 24 elders worshiping Jesus. You've got angels worshiping Jesus because of what he's accomplished. Then John says, then I started hearing praise from everybody, those above the earth, those under the earth, those in the sea. What is he doing there? John is speaking about the fulfillment of Philippians chapter 2 when we read that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So then John says, I, I, I hear this incredible company of worshipers, and they're saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Friends, it's coming. It's coming when every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But we get to do it now. We get to raise our voices and worship and praise now. I, we don't need to wait. We, we can't wait. We need to express our love, our adoration. And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. All this is happening, and we read last week how the four creatures, for all eternity, what are they doing? They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and who was and who is to come. But at this particular scene, they change their speech. And after they see all that's going on, and it says, and the four creatures said, amen. For all eternity. For all eternity, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But when they see that scene, 
when people are declaring that Jesus, Jesus is Lord, that Jesus defeated the devil, the four living creatures. Amen. Amen. Well, let me tell you something, friends. The four living creatures, they don't know what it is to be redeemed. The angels don't know what it is to be redeemed. They don't know what it is to be saved. The people in this building, the people in this building, you and me, we know what it is to be saved. Some of you, some of you have some amazing stories of salvation. You've got dramatic stories of salvation where God pulled you out of the pit. And then some of you have a story like mine where we gave our lives to Jesus at a very young age and he kept us, he kept us from the deep scars of sin. Let me tell you something, friends. Everybody in this house that knows Jesus as Savior, we should be worshiping. We should be praising. If you notice something else, <laughs> Jesus shows up and they didn't need a worship leader. Isn't that something? Jesus showed up and the four living creatures didn't need somebody. Well, let's sing five songs and warm you up. <laughs> the 24 elders didn't need anybody. Come on, sing it louder. The angels, <laughs> they just came over. I got to ask you, friends, why is it that some of us are so resistant to giving him praise? been redeemed like I've been redeemed we need to be singing praises friends and I've been there before, and I've told you this before I've told you this before oh you know but that's not oh, that's not you know that, that expressive you know that's not part of my character well it's not about your character it's about God's character number one and what's the other one well pastor I don't know you know I worship in my heart I get that you worship in your heart, but you praise with your mouth. Yeah, but you know, Pastor, it's, it's not part of my personality. Well, then, I've told you before, get a new personality. You cannot come up with one good excuse for not praising your king. No, you can't. So when we, we're going to end this service, I want it to end it in, with praise. I also want to end it with invitation. Do you need the Lord to unseal his scroll of his will and purpose over your life? Have you not yet invited him to come into your life as your savior, as your king? You can today. Today. Open yourself to him. Confess your need of him. Confess your sin that you've been living life on your terms with no regard for your creator. And turn away from that. Ask him to forgive you. He will. And he'll step into your life. Let's stand. Let's stand. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, for the scene in heaven. We thank you, God, for what you've done in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing right now. And God, I pray in Jesus' name for those in this room that as of yet have not surrendered to Christ. But, Father, they sense, they feel, Lord, the urging. They feel, Lord, the drawing of your Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name that they'll say yes to you. I come against any resistance. I come against any lie of the devil. And, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that they will say yes to you and receive you, God, as Savior and King. And then, God, for those of us who are walking with you, God, I pray in Jesus' name that, that, that as we sing praises to your name, Lord, as we wrap up this service, God, that we would be determined to be a praising people all the time, all the time. Because Jesus, Jesus broke the curse over our life by his sacrificial death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. Father, we thank you. We bless you. So, friends, as Pastor Shannon leads us, I want to encourage you to come to these altars. If you need Jesus as your Savior, please come. Please come and call out to him and invite him into your life. If you're walking with Jesus, but you just want to come on, come on up here and give him praise, 
you do that. You do that. And let's fill these altars. And all of us, whether you come or you stay in your seat, give him praise. Give him praise. Make him the focus as we wrap up our time together. Pastor Shannon, team, you lead us, friends. You can begin to move toward these altars.